So I'm just going to introduce the two of you uh, quickly. I'm Kelly Blue. I'm the teen librarian here at Portland Public Library. Um, so that means I'm in charge of all of the teen collections and the teen programming and all things teen. Uh, so Jillian French is the author of three books for young adults, Grit, The Door to January, and The Lies They Tell, which comes out in, on May 1st. Grit has been nominated for an Edgar Award, and The Door to January has been nominated for a Bram Stoker. A Maine native, Jillian holds a bachelor's degree in English from the University of Maine Orono and currently lives in Herman with her husband and two young sons. Megan Fraser Blakemore is an award winning author for children and young adults. Her middle grade novels include The Firefly Code, The Friendship Riddle, The Spy Catchers of Maple Hill, and The Water Castle, um, all from Bloomsbury. Her books for young adults are Good and Gone, Very in Pieces, and Secrets of Truth and Beauty. Megan's books have been honored with inclusion on state lists as Junior Library Guild selections and as Best Books from Kirkus, Bank Street College, and Amazon. A school librarian, Megan has a BA from Columbus, Columbia University and an MLS from Simmons Graduate School of Library and Information Science. Your fellow librarian. Yeah. <laughs> um, where she is currently pursuing doctoral work. She has taught writing to students in elementary through graduate school. She lives in Maine with her husband, children, two cats, a leopard gecko, and sometimes a hive of bees. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. Uh, one really important question I especially like to ask YA authors um, when we're talking in front of adults is why write for teenagers? Um, I would say that that time was just very significant for me um, in my life. It's something that has really stuck with me over the years. Um, it was in many ways a really dark and difficult time as I think it is for a lot of us and uh, reading was a major escape of mine. Uh, to get away from that, books were so important. Um, I really can't overstate how important they were to me. And I already knew I wanted to write at a very young age, and I kind of pinpointed YA when I was in high school, because I knew I wanted to give kids my age who were going through what I was going through an escape and, you know, maybe, maybe a little help, a little direction. Um, that's really what inspires me to write for YA. Yeah, I feel the same way. I, when I was a teenager, there was some way, but not as much as there is now, and I really wanted to um, write sort of smart books for smart kids, is what I told myself as a teenager. And now I write middle grade and young adult, and for me, um, sort of the difference is middle grade is figuring out the world around you, and young adult is figuring out yourself, and there's so many firsts that make it really interesting to write about. Uh, I know when I was a teen and I actually worked in the library, the only teen books were a required reading shelf from the local high school. So it's really the, the publishing industry in YA. It's just been an incredible flourishing um, in the last couple of years. Um, so picking up on that, what draws you to writing realistic fiction for teenagers as opposed to fantasy or sci-fi or another genre? I don't know, that's sort of a tricky question because again, like my middle grade does tend to be sort of fantasy or science fiction or have some sort of magical elements, but I think, I think it's sort of what you were talking about, just like I, I just feel right back the way I was as a teenager and I wasn't interested in fantasy as a teenager and I think those realistic experiences come, come to the front. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Fantasy um, didn't appeal to me as a teen and it's, I still don't read much of it, it's kind of rare for me too, um, but yeah, realistic was the way that I kind of could see my own world reflected back at me and try to make some sense of it. And so um, that's why I write realistic, is that not that you can't have those, those truths in fantasy, because you certainly do, but um, I feel most comfortable in reality, I guess. You write fantasy for middle grade. Um, do you think you'd ever try to write fantasy for young adults or realistic I don't know. And I wouldn't, I mean, I guess calling my middle grade fantasy is a little bit of a stretch. It's like there's magical elements within the real world, so maybe I can see myself doing that. And there's a hint of that in Good and Gone where there's the fairy tale that plays out right. in each um, chapter. But yeah, I just, I don't know if that, I, I can't imagine a story that would have that for teenagers in my, obviously, I can imagine those that exist, but not in my own head. Um, so you're both, uh, you both live in Maine. Um, you're from New Hampshire yeah. and you're from Maine originally. Um, how does living in this part of the country, and in Maine specifically, like influence or impact your writing? I tend to set things in small towns um, because that's where I grew up. Um, 
our school was tiny. We had 250 kids, middle school and high school combined. And um, so a large part of the experience of my teen years was suffocation, feeling smothered, feeling limited, and seeing myself through um, that same narrow lens in regards to what I was capable and how far I could go. I really, I had very low confidence and didn't really reach for the stars. And so um, as I grew older, I could kind of see that I was limiting myself. But in teen years, I think that's a very universal feeling for kids from rural areas and those who live in small towns is feeling trapped, feeling smothered. And that's something that I like to explore in my writing. It definitely inspires me. This doesn't really answer your question, but that's sort of interesting because yeah. I grew up in Durham, New Hampshire, which is a university town. And um, I feel like we never had limits placed on us because so many people's parents were professors and they came from other places to that town. And we were always taught to look out and to aim high. So it's sort of interesting, just sort of shows you how much your community yeah. can hold you back or push you forward. Um, so as a relative new Mainer from away, <laughs> um, I think for me, it influences how I think about um, how people see Maine and then how M Maine fits into the rest of the world. And, um, but again, it's interesting because most of my young adult, the characters are from New Hampshire, which is where I grew up, so I think that's part of drawing back to that as well. Yeah. Um, why did you, you, you kind of touched on this already, but um, how did you start writing and why did you move into becoming an author? Um, I started writing, um, I finished my first book length manuscript um, when I was a freshman in high school. It was totally terrible and I wrote one about one a year. <laughs> <laughs> after that and I had total faith in them and I shopped them around to literary agents and they got tons of rejections like well up to a hundred rejections before I would stick it in a box and start a new one um, I think it just uh, my parents really encouraged reading uh, my whole family as readers and so I think that that just um, really inspired me to be a writer from a young age and then um, as time went on I um, kind of honed my skills a bit and uh, kind of lagged off a little bit in college, kind of getting some of those new social experiences, because I went to uh, University of Maine, Orono, which was huge for me, you know, coming from Searsport District High School, you know, it was like this whole new world, and so I kind of did the social thing for a couple of years, and then got back into writing, and uh, kind of kept on plugging after that. I wrote some short fiction, some short horror fiction for adults as a way to try to break in and make a little money, um, because I just still wasn't having much success with acceptances, and uh, that did help me get in. I, I placed in some contests and stuff, and then many years later, <laughs> I, <laughs> I signed a contract with Island Port Press um, right in Yarmouth, and that kind of was the beginning of my career opening up. Um, so my school, we, we learned to write before we learned to read. Um, so it's sort of like this emergent literacy approach, and so every, the writing workshop was part of every grade from kindergarten through 10th grade. In 10th grade you had a required writing workshop class. Um, and then we also had advanced writing that you could take in high school. So I, it was just part of my daily life to write and revise and share and all of those things that you need to be able to do as a writer. Um, and then I went to college and I was in the writing program and I sort of went and been like, I'm gonna write young, I don't think I even knew they were called young adult. I'm like, I'm gonna write for teens. Um, and no one ever said no, but there was like this definite like, <laughs> like <laughs> that's not a good use of your time. So then I started trying to write short stories for grown-ups, and um, you know I would share my short stories and novels for grown-ups, and people would say, well, you know the most interesting character is the teenager, and so after hearing that a bunch of times, I finally sat down and wrote for for young adults, and I also have a terrible high school novel. It's like it's. <laughs> so melodramatic like a girl goes yes. she lives in mexico and her mom has already died and then her dad meets the sailing instructor and then of course the sailing instructor has an aneurysm it's like terrible <laughs> but the process of like knowing that you can do it i think is one of the yeah. most important things yeah finishing that first draft i think is a huge affirmation of like i can do this and maybe not everybody in the whole world can so maybe that means something yeah it can really can keep you going even when the rejections start pouring in you have a plot you're embarrassed of or a... Oh man, yes, I wrote this ridiculous, ridiculous book called The Island where um, this girl went to a writing conference on an island and there was this insane family that had 
three sons, and one of them had been accused of murder, and she ended up having to stay at their house because, like, the only motel was closed or something like that, and uh, getting embroiled in the whole mystery, and it was, oh, it was so bad, and I still sent it to agents, which is the worst, <laughs> most embarrassing thing. <laughs> um, can you describe your writing process? So this might be interesting because we're both parents of young children. My father-in-law was visiting. He was like, so do you write better in the morning or at night? And I was like, I write when there's time. <laughs> and that's when I write. Um, and I write really messy, loose first drafts. I call them skeleton drafts. Oftentimes, there will just be dialogue or it'll say, like, something exciting should happen here. Um, and then I go back and revise and revise and revise. I'm a major reviser. Good for you for letting yourself write that first draft and not getting bogged down in revision in that first draft, just letting yourself go. Because I have a hard time with that. I know it's the best way, but every single time, I just, I'll hit something I can't get past. It'll block me. Because, um, yeah, I write. Now we kind of have a system down at my house. I usually write in the morning if I can, unless something unusual is going on. But, um, yeah, I, I don't really outline Sometimes I'll write a chapter by chapter outline um, as I'm going just to sort my thoughts out because I find that my, my brain has just gotten fuzzier and fuzzier with sleep deprivation and all that stuff from having young kids. I just, I have a hard time keeping my thoughts straight now. So um, that helps. But if I went too far ahead, I don't know if you feel this way, um, it would kill the fun. Like it would kill the experience of discovering the story for yourself as the writer um, because I think that's definitely a part of it, at least for me. Um, I know there are some authors who are very organized and draft everything out chapter by chapter and they know exactly what's going to happen. But for me, the, the discovery really is the fun and what makes it the thing that I'm most passionate about. I agree. I don't outline it. I will write that messy draft and then I'll outline. Oh, that's and good. And sort of figure out what my actual story is, what needs to stay, what needs to be added. And I, I do that sort of continuously throughout the revision process. That's interesting. I should try that. <laughs> So now we're going to get into the meaty yeah. questions. Um, I, I want you to speak about all of your books, um, but I'm, I base these questions on the fact that I read back to back um, Good and Gone and Grit uh, and was so excited that they had so much, I feel that they have so much in common. Um, so both books um, show us that it's not always easy to recognize um, abuse or assault um, in a relationship or in general. Um, it's not always black and white. Uh, it's not always easy to real recognize manipulation in relationships. Um, so can you talk about why it's important to write about these teens having these experiences? Um, yeah, um, it's, it's very close to my heart and something, those subjects tend to pop up in my writing um, generally uh, in one form or another. Um, I think because when I was a teen, um, I definitely ran into those experiences myself uh, and I didn't know how to react. No one had ever talked to me about how to respond when someone came at me sexually, especially a man who was a lot older than me. I just, it's totally unprepared. And um, during some of those instances, I froze. Um, I just froze. Like, I, I couldn't speak, I couldn't move. And uh, it was, it stayed with me, you know? It was just a feeling of being totally powerless. And I think that is something that, and I'm sure, you know, these days, I'm kind of old, you know, I'm sure things have changed. But um, these days, maybe you talk about it a bit more. It's a bit more out in the open. but. Um, when I was growing up, that was nothing that was done in health class. You know, my parents would never have felt comfortable talking to me about something like that. And uh, so I'm hoping that my books can provide an outlet for teens young, and young people and adults who haven't fully processed things that may have happened to them when they were that age and why they couldn't just fight back, why they couldn't just scream no. You know, it's like sometimes you are so unprepared and so young and so naive, you can't, you don't, you don't have a voice. And um, I hope that my books will help kids find their voice, maybe years down the road, but in some way. Okay, I think, and obviously the conversation has changed so much. Um, the Good and Gone, I think, came out pretty much the same week as the Harvey Weinstein scandal broke. 
And I had been thinking like, oh, this is a way to, s to start conversations about consent. And now it's, I feel like these books are more about like how to support conversations. I think people are much, like very quickly, much more willing to start and have those conversations. And I think books can be a way to do that. And for me, I was just sort of thinking about how we've done a really good job of teaching like no means no. And everybody should know that when somebody says no, that means stop. But the more complex, when you don't say no, but you don't say yes, when you do freeze and understanding that. Um, and I think there's also a lot of stereotypes about who the aggressors are. And as we've seen, often it's the people who, who are sort of self-proclaimed good guys who are actually the manipulators. And that's Seth in my book, Good and Gone. Clay, you know, he claims he's a feminist. He, he's like, he's the artsy guy. And I think, um, you know, we do readers a disservice when we're like, it's the jock that's always going to be the rapist. Yeah. Um, and being more subtle and, and showing all of the different sides is important. Yeah, good for you for show, because that's just so refreshing, at least from what I've read, um, to see that sometimes it is the artsy, you know, could be the theater guy, you know, or something like that, or the, just the overachieving, you know, a student, you know. Yeah, it's not the football player, because that's just such a tired old cliche and so untrue, you know, it's just so... Good for you. I'm glad you did that because <laughs> it needs to get out there. And I also wanted to talk about like within relationship abuse because yeah. I think there are some really great books and movies and you know things out there to talk about that. But a lot of time when we have politicians saying things like real rape, you know, I think yeah. we need to try to, to try to push back against that. And, and this is the way that I can do that. Yeah, absolutely. What was really interesting to me is that um, both Lexi and Darcy. Um, don't necessarily realize themselves mm -hmm. that they are being abused right. um, or that the situation was not what it should, like that you weren't, you know, yeah, that's, you know, with Darcy, yeah, that's what I do, I'm comfortable having sex, but uh, that wasn't right. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, those varying degrees. Yeah, um, I think that it, um Looking at it from those um, kind of those gray areas, that was what part of the root of where um, grit began was me wanting to. I mean, statistics say that two out of three sexual assaults are not reported in this country, and there are many fantastic books out there that could tell a reader exactly what to do if they were sexually assaulted. It could even give them the steps, you know, almost like a manual, um, and that's wonderful because we need those. Um, I wanted to write about one of those girls who didn't report and why she didn't, how she came to that. Because um, sometimes it can be hard, like how could you not tell someone that someone did that to you? How could you not go to the police? And um, I just wanted to talk about how it's kind of a victim's right to work their way through these things their own way. Just because you're a victim does not mean that you are suddenly canonized and becoming an advocate or an activist. You know. It, you need to fight back in your own way, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. And I think it take, can take a very long time for an individual to find out how to do that. I think one of the things that's made me upset and uncomfortable about, about the current conversation, um, especially in terms of Hollywood, is when people are like, well, why didn't she say something? She wasn't looking out for other actresses. So even people like Gwyneth Paltrow, and who are, have made, who are arguably untouchable, um, you still, it's putting yourself out there in a way that I don't think is fair to ask victims. And that's one of the things that Lexi struggles with in the book is she knows that he's moved on to somebody else and what is her responsibility? And what can she do? How does she protect herself while still protecting other people? And is that even her responsibility? Yeah, it's a, it's a really important and fascinating discussion that needs to be had, I think. Yeah, it's like suddenly you've been attacked or somehow abused and now you have a responsibility on your shoulders? You know, it's like, how is that fair? Where does that come from? But does that make it any less true? Uh, yeah, it, there's so many angles to look at it. It really does, it just gives you, you know, you go so many directions with the book. Um, Another thing that Lexi struggles with is um, how girls and women tear each other down mm -hmm. and don't support each other. Um, and that was really sad to watch. Um, you know, and sad to see her recognize that. Right. Um, so that was really interesting as well. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, about the character of Seth, the, the artsy guy that wears the, the, the feminism t-shirt. The first 
time we see him, he's rescuing a mouse out of a pool, which seems like such a sweet and tender thing to do and obviously is appealing to Lexi. But then, you know, the male characters start to develop in a way that's kind of horrifying mm -hmm. um, as the, the, the female protagonist is realizing. Um, how do you write a male character like that or how do you get inside the head of adolescent boys? Because all of your male characters, not just um, the antagonists, are, are really complex um, and interesting. I mean, I work, I'm, so I'm, a, I'm in an elementary school now, but I work as a school librarian and I have worked in high schools and I think just sort of paying attention and having conversations with those, with those teenage boys. Um, yeah, and they're not all monsters. No. <laughs> like some of them are very, very nice teenage boys because they do exist. <laughs> yeah, it's really important to me to uh, not tear down the majority to build up the minority. Um, I love guys. My, my friends were always boys growing up, and I think that's part of what has really helped me to get into their heads for, you know, any, any sort of male character. Um, you know, I had a couple real close female friends, and growing up I had a big pack of boys that I ran around with right up through graduating college. Um, and that's definitely informed my writing. It really helped me to see, to kind of see from their angles a lot more, especially with sexuality, especially in college, because everybody knows how it's out of control in college. It's crazy. And um, I was lucky that I was friends with a lot of nice guys, but I also saw them get themselves into situations that afterwards they'd be like, oh my God, what was I thinking? You know, and it wasn't necessarily hurting anyone. It was just being so impulsive and uh, being young and figuring out the ropes of sexuality and girls and boys are doing it at the same time. And uh, I just, I think it's really important to make, try to show all these different variety of male character and that they're also struggling at the same time to figure out what's okay. What do girls want? You know, how far can I go? Do I, should I be asking or should I just be figuring it out? You know, I think that's a danger that boys and girls both run into. They're also bombarded with messages that create a toxic masculine culture right. or a sexist culture. Um, so we forget that they're still children and that they're constantly being surrounded by these messages too. It's so true, yeah. Um, it's, it is a little scary, you know. There, there are biases on both sides and they're, you know, boys are struggling with stuff at the same time that girls are. And so that's why I think it, you know, we're so lucky that we get to write about this age group, even though I know sometimes people kind of are like, Pshaw, why, you know, <laughs> and like, that's okay with me. Um, I think it's just, it's an honor. If you do a good job and you hear from a kid that says, I loved your book, you know, then you did something right. And yeah, it's just a real honor. You also have a character that's um, very clinically depressed. Um, and I thought if I was a teen reading that, um, that would have really been helpful to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and depressed not for any major life reason necessarily, but just suffering from depression. Um, I think showing those characters too is really important. Right, and that was hard to write too because Lexi is her brother who's depressed and she doesn't have a lot of sympathy for him at first and trying to make sure the audience knew that I, <laughs> not that I had sympathy, but that, like, that his character deserved sympathy as well and, um, and trying to find that balance was hard. Um, seeing their interactions with her and her brother, uh, they were so, I have a brother, so it was just so <laughs> painful to see how they tore each other down. Whereas in your book, you have uh, siblings that are incredibly supportive. Um, do you have brothers and sisters? Did that inform your writing? I have an older brother, yeah, and he, I just idolized him, you know, and in some ways I still do, you know, it just... Uh, he was two and a half years older and he was good at sports and he was so nice and he was just this really great guy. Like he's just a great guy. And uh, so I was really lucky. We didn't have that close relationship that I depicted and not having any sisters. I don't know if that kind of made me, it, I've always been a little curious of what it would be like to have sisters. And I, I guess I kind of wanted to write about the relationship that I would have liked to have had if had I, did I have sisters and that I hope exists out there for people. And I have an older brother, and, and the relationship between Lexi and her brother is different than the one I had with my brother, although we did not get along, especially while he was four years older than me. He was, um, he struggled a lot in school, and um, so he, we just, 
had different roles in the family that were a little tricky to navigate, but um, I definitely drew on that when I was writing. And there's one scene where Lexi calls him for help and he won't come and get her. And that actually happened to me. Not I had food poisoning and I didn't want to walk. Um, so nowhere near as drastic as in the book. But I just like I remember. I'm still like angry <laughs> that he did not come to get me. And I think um, yeah, I'm just drawing, being able to think back to what our relationships were. But I think it also helped me to try to figure out some of the, the ways that he acts. I think whenever we write, we're trying to figure some many things out. And for me, I think that was trying to figure out the the tension between our relationship, because we're friends now, and we should have been friends then, but... They're so mean to each other. <laughs> it was, I, I, like, there were a couple of times where I was like, oh, and they, they, they can't break out of that routine mm-hmm. um, to be kind to each other. That's part of what's happening. So it was, it was really hard to read, but also really fascinating. Um, can you talk about, uh, Obviously, um, when we were talking um, through email that feminism is important in your work, can you talk about feminism in YA literature or in your work in particular? Yeah. Um, I think um, these days, I mean, what's happening right now um, in our culture, it's a little more popular to be a feminist, I would say. I would say um, early 90s when I was um, like middle school, it was still popular then. It was still considered cool. It's kind of like holdover from the 80s where it was still considered cool to be a feminist. It wasn't necessarily mean you were a lesbian and hated men, you know. And then I went through, I think it really seemed like a time where it was like I would not have described myself that way because I think it would have put people off. I would say like mid, I don't know if you guys felt that way or not, it was like mid 90s, kind of through the early 2000s. It just came kind of like a dirty word, I felt like. And um, it's important. Uh, striving for equality is what's important to me. Um, you go on Twitter and it's terrifying. You know, the stuff that you see on there, you know, I know you can only take it with a grain of salt because it's Twitter, but it's still, you see it and it, oh, it hurts. You know, just seeing man hating and then down in the comments, woman hating, somebody's hitting back, you know, and it's just, um, it's like a war and that's not what I want to propagate in my work. I want to try to show, you know, kind of like Essie Hinton says in The Outsiders, it's tough all over. You know, things are tough all over. Um, Equality, understanding, trying to get into the heads of um, the other gender is what's important to me. Um, And that's really what drives my writing. I mean, I think, so I I hear what you're saying about like the feminism sort of being like pushed back, but I would like, I was like, oh. (laughs) Um, So I, I went to Columbia, which, became um, co-ed fairly late. It was 1987, I believe, that they started allowing women. And I was there, um, 95 to 99. And I would be in classes, and women would say, I'm not a feminist, but, and the part of me would be like, then leave, like, <laughs> because we fought so hard to be here. <laughs> um, and so I've always sort of been pushing. And then I feel like, you know, life happened. And I was like, well, it's taken care of. Like, things are equal. We're yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, and then the past few years have been really eye-opening for me in that res- respect. And then also sort of learning about, like, more sort of intersectional feminism and things like that. Um, in terms of my writing, um, so, like, Good and Gone is a road trip novel. And typically in road trip novels, you know, the character meets different people along the way that help them through their problems. And in early drafts, some of the people she met were guys who were teaching her things. And I realized, I'm like, if I really want to write a feminist road trip novel, then it should be different women who are teaching her different things about what it means to grow up as a woman in American society today. So I changed some of the characters, either changed them into female characters or changed characters that were there and and had them play a different role. And I do that a lot, actually. Like, if I'm writing in a a uh, sort of secondary character, or tertiary character comes in, I sort of question, like, well, why did you make them a man? Why did you make them a woman? It's like I'm working on a middle grade novel now, and there's a, like, a animal control officer. And so at first it was a male character, and I'm like, well, why not have it be a woman? Like, it doesn't impact the story in any way, so I might as well flip it and see what happens. That's, that's really great that you are constantly thinking that, because I don't think it's a given for all authors. And um, I catch myself sometimes, you know, and... Sometimes I don't catch myself. <laughs> and so, and then afterwards, you know, people might make a point online that's like, uh, right to the heart, you know, but it's too late. Can't take it back. It's my published. And um, that's really good that you've always kind of got the gears turning with, you know, maybe I can portray this from a different gender standpoint or, yeah, no, that's fantastic. 
it was also great for her to, I think, because those characters, she could see herself mirrored back. Right. And you see her start to recognize some of her own tendencies in those female characters. Mm-hmm. There's, she, there's one, she's like, I just want to tell her to stop, stop doing that, but I can't find the language to do it. Um, so she's finally recognizing, like, I do this too. Right. Um, so that was really important. Um, so a little anecdotal, um, upstairs in the teen library. So February is Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. Um, and we tried to put together a display on um, YA books that feature healthy and positive relationships. It is really hard. Um, <laughs> It's much more easy to find um, really questionable relationships, um, really questionable behavior. Um, you know, I, I remember one book I read that everybody loved, and I'm not going to tell you what it was, um, where I was like, this, the men in this book grab women all the time and, pull, and like push them, or like, in, I was like, does anybody else notice this, that they're being yeah. handled all the time? Or, and they're teenagers. Um, so, but, or just having like a positive, healthy relationship. It's really hard to find those books. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about that imbalance in teen lit or maybe in literature in general. Yeah, um, I think I am constantly, so I don't read any of the, um, I'm just throwing her name out here, but like Sarah Dessen or Suzanne Colasanti, people like that who write fun, you know, there are issues, but you know, they write fun, light romances. Good romances. Yeah, feel good romances. Um, I will say I don't see those books getting nominated for awards, which is sad, you know, because I'm, I'm sure they're deserving plenty of the time. You know, I've read a lot of Sarah Dessen, um, and uh, they just don't get the nods that the dark stuff does. Now, that is not my, that is not what fuels me to write what I write. Um, <clears throat> I tend to try to write the story I want to read, and um, I also don't read a ton of that stuff, and so that's part of it. Um, but I know what you mean. It's very hard. I've heard people say that before, that it's very tough to find positive relationships or healthy relationships. Um, and even when I'm writing a couple I want to get together in the book, <clears throat> excuse me, I, uh, I'm constantly afraid of it being saccharine or corny or people not buying it. And so then I, you know, I'm like, oh, should I add something in here? Should there be more trouble? I, I don't know. And yeah, it's definitely out there. It's, it's, a, it's a thing in YA um, that I don't know if it'll ever change. And it's definitely in the back of my mind when I write. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, a story has to have some sort of struggle. So a story about a good relationship would actually have to be about something else where the good relationship is sort of the context or the setting. So I mean, I think like the Sarah Dessen books, they, you know, they're not often, sometimes they're not about the relationship they're about, whatever else is going on in the girl's life. Yeah. And, you know, whether, you know, and some of them are, they're not good relationships, but the ones where it is a good relationship, it would be good. Um, but, and sort of like thinking about what we were talking about earlier, I wish there were more sort of sex positive books about girls, but more books about boys who are, are, who don't want to have sex or who are scared about it or who are reluctant because I think the messaging is, that's a true message. And I think, like you were saying, we're, ta- you know, we, there's a sort of, um, a sense of who boys are supposed to be, and if they don't, if they don't see that it's okay and normal to be like, ah, I'm not ready for this. Yeah, so. that's true. Because yeah, boys get pushed, 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 and if you don't do it, your friends are gonna rip you to shreds. You know, it's just, it's just a part of male culture. It just, it's so ingrained. Even girls, I think, even even we might be like, ah, you know, if you if you hear about when you're that age, you know, that um, you know, what's the matter with him that he's not going for that, you know, and it's like kind of just so ingrained. When you're older and you have your own kids, you're like horrified. <laughs> but you know, when you're in that moment, um, yeah, I think those cliches and those stereotypes just embed themselves in society, and you just see it over and over again in TV and in books and in just playing out in front of you and. Uh, it can be very hard to kind of write a book that doesn't reflect those things, no matter how much it might bother you to see it out there. I think it, I mean, and in, in both of your books, I don't think you're unintentionally trying to show, un, I mean, you're very intentionally trying to right. show like unhealthy relationships in those gray areas, but um, I'm thinking there's a lot of fantasy where the relationships are problematic, right. um, really problematic. Twilight is not a good relationship. <laughs> it's not a good relationship. <laughs> Um, you know, so uh, I do think it's in realistic fiction. It's absolutely important to show that. It's just I'd love to see. We could not come up with 
any fantasy, where uh, except magical realism, good and gone by uh, not good and gone. Where the moon was ours, mm. um, which uh, was the one book that had like magical elements to yeah. it, where the relationship was healthy. I've only read the first Graceling book, but I've heard that yes, that is. That's, are good. And that's a sex positive book too, yeah. which is yeah. another thing. Um, you have a character who's very comfortable in her sexuality and likes having sex, and that's almost revolutionary to write about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, um, and that was a stretch for me because, you know, it was definitely not, I was not in my comfort zone writing her. Um, it was really important to me to write that, and afterwards it was so fun and so freeing to write certain aspects of of Darcy because she just she did like having sex and if she saw a boy she wanted she went after him and um, was really cut down and criticized by a lot of people in her life and had developed a bad reputation because of that whereas it was you know swap the genders it wouldn't have been that would be like hey he's a player you know and so I really wanted to talk about that um, but for me you know I was so shy so not there when I was in high school and it's just like very naive in a lot of ways and uh yeah i think that it it can be hard to find one even with the slut shaming that's in my book it's hard to find one that doesn't have the slut shaming that is sex positive i i can't think of one right off the top of my head um which is too bad i'm sure i've missed some fantastic titles but i graceling graceling is one yeah (laughs) um but it's a totally different situation um it's a not even a world that we live in so um yeah the the slut word is thrown a lot around a ton in good and gone too um by everybody girls boys um that double standard is just so toxic what are you guys working on in the next year, 2018, what are you looking forward to? You have a book coming out in May. But... I do. Um, my next book is coming out on May 1st. It's called The Lies They Tell, and it's a straight-up teen mystery. Um, I think it has good crossover potential. It's set in a Bar Harbor-like town and uh, centering around a girl who works in a country club, and uh, she's trying to solve a recent murder of a summer family that has happened in town. Um, and she does that by infiltrating a group of privileged summer boys who are part of this country club and uh, things get more dangerous. And it was so much fun to write and it's very close to my heart. Uh, a lot of the emotions in that book came from my own life and so it's just, um, I'm really happy to share it with people. And uh, I just submitted the manuscript for the book I have coming out from Harbor Teen uh, in 2019, literally just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> and so right now I'm on vacation and then I'm gonna see where I'm at and uh, hope maybe they're interested in something I can pitch to them. Um, well, tomorrow I'm supposed to submit something to my editor, but I really, oh, so <laughs> exciting! Oh, God. Um, it's a middle grade novel. Um, it's called The Story Web, and it's um, this is like so. This is one where fantasy elements come into it. Um, there's a, the main characters. Um, her her father is gone, and you find out pretty quickly it's because he has PTSD and has sort of checked himself into oh. a hospital, and so she's stopped doing a lot of the things she likes, namely playing hockey. Um, but the background story is that there's an actual web, a story web, that connects us all, and it's a literal, physical thing. Um, and the story web is in their town, and it's starting to fall apart. And so she and she thinks she needs to fix it. There's some other kids who think that they need to fix it. Um, and as happens in pretty much all of my books, then they come together because <laughs> they need to fix it. That sounds um, fantastic. Yeah, together. Wow. So um, that's the number one. That's where the animal warden came into it. <laughs> um, and then I also just sold a series of books for like grades one through three Good that are, um, it's Frankie Sparks, the world's greatest third grade inventor. And she solves all of her day to day problems by inventing things. Oh my gosh, that is so cool with the STEM tie in. Good for you. That's fantastic. I'm really excited about those. Awesome. Cool. Do you guys want to ask each other any questions? Um. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, actually, how long have you been writing now? So, I mean, like, 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 like published? Um, yeah. Um, so, this is what I always tell people. So, I, um, if you want to get an agent, plan something else at the same time. So, I was getting married and sending out queries to agents, and I, I mean, I sent out millions of queries before this, but for this, my first young adult novel. Um, and Sarah Crow, who's my agent, called me the th- Thursday before my wedding. And oh, I was like, wow. I'm a little busy. 
but yes. Um, so, oh, and so I wasn't like constantly checking my email. Yeah. Um, so that was 2007, and the first book came out in 2009. Oh, good for you. That must have been like mind blowing all at once. Yeah. Oh. I think you're so right though, it's true, plan something else. I, I had been holding off on having kids because I kept thinking, well if I do that I won't become a writer, there won't be time, and I finally was like, this ain't happening, let's have kids, you know, and then um, I had my son and then, um, you know, it was just, oh geez, how old was he? He was like, about a year um, when I heard from Islandport, and then a couple months later I got my agent and then signed with Harper Teen, and so it really is, it's like, while life is happening, I think it's, that's really when it takes off. And I don't know, maybe it's just freeing for the muse. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But um, I really wondered about that. And my second part of my question with that for you is, um, what has been your biggest challenge as a published author? Um, you know, has it been getting the word out about your books? You know, has it been um, kind of giving your publisher what they're looking for with ideas? So, I mean, I just mentioned, so my first young adult novel was published in 2009. It was published with Hyperion, Disney Hyperion. And it was like, it was realistic fiction. And then it was like, Twilight. And then, so, yeah. if you were writing realistic fiction, there was no interest. And so that's when I started writing middle grade. And then when I came back into young adult, it was post John Green. So okay, yeah. then realistic fiction was huge, but it, the market is so tight that getting your publisher to support your work or getting like anyone to sort of pay like the blogs or whatever it is to pay attention is a lot harder and that's not anything that I'm especially good at and so I feel like that's the struggle like where you, you're so proud of a book and then you're trying to get it out and what do you do and how do you do it and it is it's like a has it been a learning experience because that I mean it'll be a year in May you know May um, yeah, May 16th will be a year of me being out there as a published author. And I already feel like I have learned so much about what's not worth it. What, oh, I wish I'd done that. You know, there's just, there are all these things. There's so many parts to promoting a book and getting it out there. And when you, especially when you live in rural Maine, it can be very tough because you aren't just immersed in that author culture that you would be in NYC or someplace like that. Um, it's, you're so far away from the hub. Um, it can be really tough. And yeah, it, online seems to be one of the ways that you really you know, got to figure out. And I, I'm still so far from figuring it out. Maybe I never will. <laughs> Maybe you can't figure it out. But I was curious about that. And I would put in a plug for the Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance, which I'm on the board, so, but they didn't tell me I had to say anything. Like that. <laughs> um, because that's where I felt like I've really found my community of writers of all different kinds of poets, essayists, um, fiction writers, crime writers. Like, and now I feel much more involved in the writing community. That's great. I just, I joined them and um, <laughs> it's, it has been nice. I feel more like I'm part of something now and I don't feel like I'm all alone. So that, that has been really nice. Well, Rachel, I think you're telling me that we are, we want to open it up to questions to the audience. Does anybody have any questions? How about in the back first, and then, or? All right, um, I have two questions. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Yeah. Um, I have a 13-year-old uh, a, uh, um, adopted daughter. I have older children. And, and she is so much now into graphic novels. And I came in a little bit late, and I don't know if you touched on that at all, but um, it's, it's almost an obsession. and. You know, that kind of being an, an older adult, that, that came out of the blue for me. And um, I wonder you know, if you, either of you have any experience with that or with, with kids who are just so enthralled with that. Um, and then the, the second question is, is that, do you find most of your readership um, to be girls and not boys? And who, are, who is writing for boys? <coughs> I am like, I'm like jumping out of my right. chair. Right. <laughs> writer and librarian so, here, yeah, so. I'm also a librarian. Um, and I, I personally do not read graphic novels well. So I just read the words <laughs> and I'm done in five minutes. But people who really are reading it, it's a visual literacy as well. And I think it's ever bit as much a story 
as a novel and you're just reading it in a different way. So I, I am a big fan of graphic novels and I find them on par. And it's just like anything else, like, you know, some of them are literary graphic novels and some of them are like lighter fluff and just like all of us are gonna have a varied diet. Um, you know, I think you would have a varied diet of graphic novels as well, so I really like them. Um, I would say that my readership for young adults is probably mostly girls. I hear more from my middle grade, and that's mixed, boys and girls. And I think, um, I think lots of people, I think I, one of my big things is like there's no such thing as boy books and girl books. There's the reader and there's the book. And a job as a librarian is, or a teacher is to match the reader and the book. And I personally, I hope that boys, teenage boys are reading our books. I hope it's not just teenage girls because they need the messages and they need to be able to have those discussions as much as the girls do. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And um, there's my baby. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, yes, I'm so glad that you jumped in because I was like, I, I bet she's got a lot to say as a librarian because yeah, the graphic novel question, I think I, I did work as a librarian um, before I became a full-time writer and um, there, you know, I think there, even maybe like 10 years ago, there was a lot of bias against um, graphic novels, saying it's not a real book, it's a comic book. Put that down, pick up a real book. And um, unfortunately, there's a lot of reluctant readers who will not pick up a real book. And I think if you take that graphic novel out of their hands as being fluff, just because there's pictures, um, this could be really hurting a reader. And if they're like crazy about it right now, just load them up on them. You know, just as many as she, as she can handle. You know, just... Uh, and I think she will naturally seek out more stories. I think she's learning a love of storytelling um, from these graphic novels and possibly art, you know, which is awesome. You know, that's, a, that's a really good thing. And so I think that they're really good things too. Um, and yes, some are, some are more just silly fluff and some are just as much a story as um, a, a prose novel. Um, I think they're good things, there, and um, personally, I wish I could do art so I could write some, <laughs> but I have no talent in that at all. Um, and the other half, yeah, I'd say it's probably mostly girls. Wh wh who I hear from tend to be women in their 20s. Um, that's really who I've heard from. Um, I'm not sure why, but um, every now and then I've had a teacher contact me. I spoke at Bucksport High School um, a few months ago and the librarian was so cool and she sent me a picture she took afterwards of one of the football players in the library reading my book <laughs> and that he had stopped to say how much he loved it on the way out and it just, even talking about it, I'm, I'm getting choked up. It just, it meant the world because I, you know, there are no girl books, no boy books. Unfortunately, cover designs can be a problem with that. Boys are embarrassed to check out some of these books from libraries or pick them up in a bookstore. Um, so they won't read them. And that's really, it is a shame, but I think they do get in the hands of some of the boys. And the author usually has very little control yeah. over yeah. the cover. Yeah. What was your question? Um, do I have time? Is it okay? Yeah. I think so, yeah. I just wonder, if you, you know, I hear a lot about people talking about um, writing from a different culture, so cultural appropriation. I just know what your thoughts are on gender appropriation. If you would ever write from the point of view of a, you know, when you're talking about, Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I know you've read The Water Castle. Um, so my book, The Water Castle, is third person, but it's primarily from a boy's perspective. And I, I don't know that I really thought about it too much then. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, we talked a little bit about how like personal the YA is. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not going to say no, but I, I, and I feel. I mean, I could do it, <laughs> but I, again, it would come down to the story, and I'm wondering what. Right now, I can't think of what story I would want to tell, that would be from a boy's perspective. Yeah, um, I have. I have. Um, when I was in high school, I wrote almost primarily from a boy's perspective. It was so much more comfortable for me to write those short fiction, you know, assignments for school and, um, and some of my stuff at home as well um, from a boy's perspective because I felt like I didn't have to delve into the sexuality, which is, you know, terrible and wrong, but um, the girl sexuality angle 
if I was writing with this male mask, you know, and now at that time I wouldn't have ever said that. I was a huge fan of Essie Hinton. I already referenced her, and um, I, I couldn't. I read her books again and again and again, and uh, I think it felt safe at that time. Um, and I keep, I do think about it, and I do worry about it with appropriating because you know there's so much of that. I don't want to steal anybody's stories, you know, and so I think it would be more acceptable at, within the current climate for me to write from a male point of view, being a woman. Flip that, I think that um, a male author could really get um, torn apart, maybe online. Um, I, and maybe I'm not correct on that, but um, it's definitely a risk. You are taking a risk when you do it, yeah. I mean, there, so right now in Maine, um, there's an author named Sashi Kaufman who writes so well from the teen boy perspective. Um, and, you know, that's just what, I think because she's a middle school teacher, she goes, you know, she's there every day and yeah. she can really see it. Um, so, yeah. I guess I did, I did just write, um, Target is going to carry a, a special edition of my next book and I had to write some bonus material for that, and, um, which was really cool to hear, you know, it was wonderful. Um, but I did write it, they wanted a scene from the angle, of, uh, from the viewpoint of another character in that scene, um, and the protagonist of that book is female, and so I did write it from a boy's perspective. I, I, I didn't even think of that just now. Um, it was a lot of fun, and uh, since it was just one chapter, I, I didn't worry about it. If it was a whole book, I think I would worry. That, I, oh, no, I, was, I think the question with appropriation is like, how do you know what, what you don't know? And I feel like we're sort of steeped in a male culture. And so I'm, I'm, there are things that we would probably get wrong, but it's, I think it's much less likely to happen. And I think we would, we would sort of know the questions to ask, like, would a boy think that? Would a boy, like, what is that like? And, um, and we might not even know the questions to ask about a culture that was different than that's our true. own. That's true. That's true. Okay. Well, thank you both very much for being here. Thank, thank you, you all for attending. Uh, you should buy and read all of the books. <laughs> um, I had last week off, and I spent all week reading your books, and it was the best way to spend my time off. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. Thanks. <laughs>